action plan competition and that will be run by an advocate and a board member of the Space Frontier Foundation who's also a managing partner at X's consulting firm. Please welcome to the floor Thomas Andrew Olson. Good morning. This, uh, I like to say this thing has been a long time coming, but it really hasn't. We put this together, I think, in record time to, uh, to get this thing going. I think we have some really great business plans for you guys to look at today, and we have a, an equally distinguished panel of judges to, uh, to uh, pass the judgment on them. Um, next slide, please. So our pri as again, as we've stated, our prizes, our prizes are uh, $25,000 for first, 5000 for second, and 2500 for third. The first and third place prizes were from, a, from a, um, a grant just recently received from NASA to the Space Frontier Foundation, and the $5,000 second prize was from a grant from the Heinlein Prize Trust, which has been a long time uh, patron of this competition. Next, please. Um, that's what I mean about the short amount of time, since the, uh, the, the major grant did not come until June 2nd. We only had about seven weeks to really shout this thing from the rooftops and make it happen. But in all that time, we still got 36 intents to compete. We got 25 executive summary submissions, and we managed to distill that, and not an easy task, down to five finalists. Next, please. Um, before I get to the judges, though, I was asked, I need to do a special shout out here because uh, yesterday, as part of this competition, we ran an all-day seminar. It was, a, uh, it was called a boot camp for, for the contestants, and they got to sit one-on-one -on -one with, with coaches from the industry to really help them polish their presentations and, and, get their, and make sure they're getting out the key facts for the judges to see. And I want to give a, a special shout out to all the, all the coaches, including Liz Kennick, who did a great job running the show as well. Uh, my associate over here, uh, Joel Venus, is going to be a, also be our timekeeper today. Uh, and the coaches, Amarish Kolapara, uh, Shabra Lee, David Livingston, Bob Werb. So uh, now let me introduce our judges today. We have a very distinguished panel. Now you're going to have to excuse me on this because of all the time that I've, I've spent doing lots of other things. I didn't have time to actually memorize their... Uh, their bios, so I'm going to have a Wrath of Khan moment here. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I'm going to, I'm going to start at that end. Our first, our first judge, our first judge is Steve Goldberg, PhD. He's from Benrock. Uh, he joined Benrock in 2009, having been CEO of several early stage companies, including Data Runway, Vidient, ArcWave, and CoWave Networks. He was Vice President of Research and Development at Nokia Internet Communications and VP and GM of the Wireless Communications Division at Silent Corporation. He's also held senior management engineering positions at Trimble Navigation and Hewlett Packard. Uh, he has a, and he has his uh, PhD in electrical engineering from the University of California. Please welcome Steve Goldberg. To his left, our next judge is an investment professional at Draper Fisher Yurvitson, focusing on technology investments across sectors. Prior to joining DFJ, he was an analyst at Sloan Robinson, a global emerging market hedge fund based in London. And at Sloan Robinson, he concentrated mainly on China and India, and also the technology, transportation, telecom, and luxury goods sectors. Um, he, prior to working in finance, he started he was, started three companies, including an online music service with a proprietary algorithm for personalizing the price of digital music. He has a B in computer science from Oxford, has completed level three of the CFA program. Please welcome Xander Mahoney. Our next judge is the founder and managing partner of Near Earth LLC. Previously, he was the managing director in the telecom group at Credit Suisse First Boston. His investment banking career began all the way back in 1987 as an associate of one of approximately 100 bankers at Donaldson, Lovkin, and Ginrette. And he was part of the phenomenal growth and success of DLJ to over 1,000 bankers by the time of his acquisition in 2000. At DLJ, Hoyt, he was a, Hoyt was a co-founder of the firm's Space Finance Group, Wall Street's first dedicated industry coverage group for the satellite industry. Welcome, Hoyt Davidson. Our next judge serves as a management consultant and financial advisor to a generation of space entrepreneurs by helping them develop viable businesses and navigate the world of venture finance. He co-produced the, fir the first and second annual Space Venturing Forum, an entrepreneurial event hosted by the National Space Society. In a related capacity, 
He is an executive committee member of the Space Investment Summit Coalition, which is a group of organizations focused on developing interaction between the investment community and entrepreneurial efforts in aerospace. He often speaks at aerospace conferences and topics related to the business and economics of the commercial space industry. Here's something I didn't know about him. He has a degree in molecular and cell biology, which is something we never talk about. I have a degree in biology. We never talk biotech. Well, we have to start doing that. <laughs> he also is a man who just has the most sense of anyone I know in this group. <laughs> Amaresh Kalapara. Our, our final judge is a last-minute replacement. Art Dula from Heinlein Prize Trust was supposed to be seated amongst this group today, and he couldn't make it because of medical issues. And of course, we, uh, as a great patron of this competition, we certainly wish him the best for a speedy recovery. Uh, however, he sent someone really great in his place. Uh, she is a researcher and intern program manager for Excalibur Almaz USA. Um, her project, current projects involve asteroid mining and lunar cyclers. Her work, work with Excalibur has led to involvement with the Highline Prize Trust, which led her to becoming president of the Virginia Edison Publishing Company. Um, prior to that, she was a member of NASA Academy at Marshall Space Flight Center. And while completing her undergraduate mathematics at Eastern University, she's also been a judge in the Rice University Business Plan Competition. Please welcome, at the last minute, 48 hours notice, God bless her, Leah Ott. <laughs> Next. Okay, these are the finalists, Altia Space Machines, Celestial Circuits, Final Frontier Design, New Space Publishing, and Solar Flare. These groups really represent a great cross-section of the kinds of space entrepreneurial activity that we want to see. We've got space, we've got space-related, and a new category, space scalable, which is something that will hopefully make investors lots of money here on the ground in commercial markets, but also is scalable to solve a space problem when that's needed down the road. And we've got representatives of all three amongst our, our group of finalists today. Next, please. Um, so here are the rules, very simple. Uh, each team gets a 15-minute block of time, eight minutes they have to, uh, to make their presentation, followed by the judges, uh, hammering them with questions and comments for another seven minutes. We're going to be really strict with that. Joel Venus is going to be the timekeeper, and he's going to keep, keep us on track so we can get done quickly. At the, at the end, after we've seen all five, Please stick around because I have a, uh, a last-minute announcement for you, and it involves audience participation. So uh, stay tuned for that. Our okay, first up is uh, Althea Space Machines. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm John Goff, President and CEO of Altius Space Machines, and we are developing a solution that enables nanosat launch providers to deliver payloads directly to space stations. Uh, not only does this unlock a huge new market for them, this also will enable us to achieve 20 to $70 million in annual revenues once we've scaled up to full commercial operations, and ultimately enable us to change the way space deliveries are done forever. Okay, right now, uh, just-in-time payload delivery, or just-in-time small package deliveries are a critical part of the terrestrial economy. However, this capability is not available to uh, space station utilizers such as NanoRacks and their customers. Next slide. Um, existing uh, existing uh, delivery vehicles such as the uh, SpaceX um, Dragon, they work very well for bulk cargo delivery but just as you wouldn't send a single FedEx package on a 747 all by itself, you wouldn't fly a Dragon with just a single small payload. Right now you have to manifest it in a bigger payload, which by definition makes it no longer just in time. There are currently uh, several companies in the suborbital RLV uh, group and, and elsewhere, such as X-Core Aerospace, Scaled Composites, um, Unreasonable Rocket, uh, Dynetics, that are developing what are called nanosat launch vehicles. These vehicles can put small satellites, things about this big, uh, up into space. And while they're right size for delivering these small payloads to the space station, they currently are unable to do so. Uh, the, the complex delivery vehicles such as Dragon, they don't scale down small enough and actually leave you any payload left over. Just the proximity operation sensors on Dragon alone are bigger than the payloads that we're talking about delivering here. Next slide. So the customer that we're trying to, the customer need we are addressing with Altius Space Machines is this need of how do you, 
you know, how can we enable these, uh, these nanosat launchers to service this market? If we can uh, enable them to service this market, not only are we opening a huge new market for them, but we're also addressing the needs of space station researchers and manufacturers and ultimately making them more competitive uh, compared to terrestrial counterparts. Next slide. So the solution that Altius has uh, developed, we're calling it our direct-to-station delivery service. What this does is it offloads the complex delivery functions from the visiting vehicle to the actual space station itself and allowing any rocket to service its own delivery vehicle. Um, next slide. So let me walk you through a quick cartoon of how this works. So first off, you have um, on the space station itself, you have a, uh, a sensor and control system that can tell exactly where the vehicle is and calculate the optimal trajectory. Next slide. Uh, it sends a series of burn commands to that vehicle that allows it to navigate to a safe standoff distance from the space station that is close enough, next slide, to enable our sticky boom, which I'll explain in a second, to reach out, safely grab it, and pull it into the station. Next slide. Okay, this, uh, the sticky boom, for, for lack of a better term, is a mechanical tractor beam. This thing can reach out and stick to almost any object you can think of in space. Uh, metals, plastics, asteroids, any, anything. Uh, we're developing this uh, in collaboration with SRA International here in Silicon Valley, who invented the electrotesian technology that we're using uh, to enable this uh, you know, sticking to any surface. Um, the cool thing about this is that while it sounds sci-fi, it's actually real. Uh, we brought a prototype, we fl flight tested this on a zero gravity plane here in Silicon Valley a couple months ago. And if anyone wants to try it out after all the presentations, uh, we'll be out in the hall and we'll run it till the batteries run dry. Uh, next slide. So we have a cool technology, but we've been getting real traction and interest from commercial, uh, from NASA and commercial uh, customers. We're currently working on a NASA contract uh, for Mars sample return. Um, we've also uh, we've also recently joined a Lockheed Martin joint proposal uh, for demonstrating a version of uh, this technology for uh, space junk uh, removal that will ultimately provide some of the technologies we need for our direct to station solution. Next slide. And we intend to leverage this trend in, in government and commercial interest to enable us to cover the, use that to cover the R&D expenses of bringing this technology all the way to commercial operations. Once we are in commercial operations, we're looking at a lease fee model where we would lease the hardware and provide operations and maintenance services uh, for the space station operators, and then we would charge a fee directly to the delivery vehicles. Um, and as you can see, even at uh, even at weekly flights, we're getting up into the $20 million, adult, uh, $20 million in annual revenue mark, just from commercial, uh, uh, commercial alone. So the management team we've put together is very well uh, focused on this, uh, on, this, on this marketplace. My background is a co-founder of one of the suborbital rocket companies that's interested in developing these nanosat launch capabilities, gives me a great insight into this market and not only that, I'm on a first name basis with the CEOs of almost all of our potential customers. Uh, the rest of the team we pulled together has decades of experience in aerospace uh, sales, marketing, business development, and finance. And uh, our acting CTO has 20 years experience at NASA and in commercial industry uh, developing um, deployable structures very similar to the boom part of our sticky boom. Uh, next slide. So we are raising $400,000 at, at the current time. Uh, the main focus of this, uh, we, we list several near-term things we intend to spend that on. Uh, the big, one big part is securing our IP position. We have a provisional patent already for Sticky Boom, but we want to file full patents for Sticky Boom in our direct to station delivery service so we can lock in our competitive advantage. And ultimately, by, uh, by executing this business plan, we feel we'll be in an excellent position for a merger and acquisition event sometime around when we enter commercial operations at the end of year five. So that's, that's the solution we're providing for nanosat launchers. This is an excellent opportunity for them. This is an excellent, excellent opportunity for us, and it will ultimately allow us to change the way space deliveries are done forever. And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions.
So uh, this is a leasing model. Basically, you'll own the hardware. Yeah, so it's there's a base lease, and then most of the revenue actually comes from the fees that we'd be charging uh, delivering vehicles. Uh, initially, when that's demand's ramping up, the lease is more important. But eventually, most of the revenue, most of the commercial revenue, would come from uh, from the fee service. So, so one of the challenges might be that you know this is if you build it, will I come? That you have to somehow fund the. The, the, the building and sort of inventory of these things before people actually use them and pay you fees. So does the business model sort of account for that? How much, how much total dollars do you need before you, you sort of see revenue okay. coming? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. So the development of the, of the technology, we're using, uh, we're leveraging NASA and DOD contracts to help us mature and develop, uh, and develop our first flight unit. Um, Depending, like we're still investigating the best way of implementing the, the lease structure. Um, we may end up needing to do an extra funding around several years down the road to, to finance that, but we may be able to bootstrap it directly off of these contracts. All right, thank you. Yeah. I was wondering if you can talk about the market for nanosat launchers. Um, maybe briefly comment on kind of when you think nanosat launchers will become more mainstream, what the trends are. How big will the nanosat market be in five years? Okay. Give us kind of a picture on that. Okay, yeah. Uh, actually, w when I started Altius Space Machines, I actually thought I was starting a nanosat launch uh, company. We, we discovered Sticky Boom about a month later, and we've been off to the races since then. Um, but that market, you know, it's focused on, you, you've got educational segments, you have uh, military defense and science segments where, I think that's where the main growth potential is, like launching small, and we're not talking about CubeSats per se, we're talking about things maybe about 10 to 20 kilograms that are doing Earth observation, uh, communication, things like that. Uh, one, of, one of the people I've worked with um, was, work, was involved with the NASA NanoSat, or sorry, Army NanoSat uh, group down at Huntsville, down at Redstone Arsenal, and they were working on trying to develop these. Their goal was to be able to put up a small constellation of these Earth observation satellites and communication satellites at the start of a conflict. Um, the, the market for that, th there, is a, there is a market for nanosat uh, launch capability. I don't know the exact numbers. We're probably talking on the order of eventually getting up to you know, tens, twenties, thirties of launches per year, maybe more, um, but this, like this market is actually potentially bigger than all of their other markets combined. Like this unlocks a key new area that they can't currently access by themselves. Yeah. This, can the average spacecraft withstand being grabbed by something? Are you at risk of pulling panels off? Do you need some, I mean, the, the idea of this is that it's, it doesn't matter whether the other guy has mm -hmm. your hardware, but you don't want to break his spacecraft at the same time. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the pulling force that this provides is actually pretty gentle. Um, so a lot of, a lot of the technical development is going to be around figuring out the best way to do the control and not pulling too hard so that the pads come undone from the, from the target not, or, or damaging it, things like that. that. That's part of what we're trying to use these NASA contracts to help us uh, mature. Yeah. Well, that, I think, leads into my next question. In your business plan, you said you had uh, received $200,000 to date, I think, from mm -hmm. UL. A, DARPA, and JPL. Yeah. And you were expecting uh, a total of 1.6 million by the end of the year from identified opportunities. Can you talk a little bit about, um, well, first of all, what are the, the applications of ULA, DARPA, and JPL? What, why are they paying you money? And secondly, for the, yeah. the balance of the 1.6 million, sort of who's that coming from and what are they looking for from Sticky Boom? Okay, uh, good question. Yeah, the uh, ULA contract was uh, working on some um, Centaur upper stage uh, guidance and control applications, which are actually very relevant to the uh, you're figuring out how to do this, um, doing the burns and stuff you need to do for the direct to station deliveries. Um, the DARPA project, we were actually building the avionics set for one of the nanosat launch providers, uh, building the, avi the computer brains for the upper stage of one of these providers. Uh, the JPL project is for capturing a small uh, Mars sample return canister in Mars orbit. Um, so all of these are providing pieces of the puzzle that, that feed into the end system. Uh, the, other, the other contracts that we are, you know, have 
you know, have in the pipeline that we're working on, uh, that we're working on finalizing would be, uh, we're working on, um, well, we have the Lockheed Martin uh, proposal that we're in, and that's for, as I was saying, maturing a, uh, maturing the flight readiness status, uh, a um, sticky boom, t uh, sti a sticky boom like solution for orbital debris removal. Um, we're also looking at a range of other smaller contracts for uh, developing different different facets and aspects of the end solution. Um, did that answer the question? <laughs> Thanks. How large is the exclusion zone around the ISS that you're going to drag out of fire? Oh, yeah, yeah. You actually need to guide the vehicle into into the area that's you know that's currently controlled by visiting vehicles. It, it doesn't get around that, but it allows us to offload the visiting vehicles requirements from the NanoSat launch provider more towards our side of the solution space. Could could there be an eventually a kind of standardized sealed hatch that I could walk through at some point in the future from this? Um, what we're like for for these small payloads, we're actually envisioning a solution that would use. Uh, the Japanese experimental module has this equipment airlock, and we're actually planning on things that are small enough that you could actually just fit it in through the airlock. So it's not you're not bolting it to the side of the station and opening a hatch. You're actually passing it in through a hatch that already exists on the space station. Uh, but yeah, you could eventually scale this up to solution like this scales up all the way to space shuttle sized uh, payloads um, in the future. You're talking about maturing your flight unit. What's your time frame for getting a unit flying? Okay, um, like to actually get it into space operations. Um, we're looking at, we're probably looking at two to three years out. Uh, it, it depends on the flight opportunity. Uh, the space station has a lot of additional certs and requirements that we'll have to work through that could take longer, but we're targeting about three years. Okay. Yeah. As I understand it, some of the IP belongs to SRI and some, some you're developing. Mm -hmm. um, where are you in terms of a, a licensing agreement with SRI? Yeah. Obviously, the, the terms of that could affect your business model. Mm -hmm. um, and just sort of tell us what they own, what you own. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right now, um, you know, this is the area that we're actively negotiating with SRI. We're also trying to get a you know, strategic partnership relationship, not just, the, not just the licensing structure. They're helping us develop, you know, n not just electrotesian aspects, but also potentially some other... Um, details of, uh, of making, you know, the, the compliance structure work and everything else. So they own the underlying technology for electrodhesion and as well some complementary technologies which we may be taking advantage of. Uh, we develop Sticky Boom and, uh, yeah, we develop Sticky Boom and direct to station and there's also some overlapping areas that we both have some ownership, so we'll probably be doing some uh, joint patents with them as well. But a lot of those details we're still in active negotiation on. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, John. Just as, as an extra note, I didn't think I had to mention this, but I will. Uh, uh, we're not taking questions from the audience on these for the contestants. This is strictly Q&A on behalf of the judges for the event. So uh, we may have some chance for audience participation later on, but I will make that announcement at the end of this program. Thanks so much in advance. Okay, next up is Celestial Circuits. I'm Steve Bress, and this is Jim Dunstan. We're with Celestial Circuits. We are starting to build the flight computers for the next generation of new space experiments. We're really standing at the precipice of a new dawn of experimentation in space. And for those who aren't involved in a space on a day-to-day -day basis, probably what you're thinking is the shuttle is ending. Uh, we're ending manned space flight for, for, for a particular period of time. But in fact, along with that is, is a real set of opportunities. You, you heard George Whitesides earlier this morning talk about Virgin Galactic is excited about flying suborbital space uh, um, experiments. Uh, space News has an Alan, Alan Stern on the front page talking about uh, suborbital uh, experimentation. We've got a real, real dawn of a new market here. Next slide. If I want to conduct a chemistry experiment, the first thing I don't do is invent the Bunsen burner. I take one off the shelf, or I go to Bunsen burners are us, or I go to eBay and buy one down. The problem for space experimenters currently is 
they have to spend as much time building their computers and building all the pieces of their experiment as they do building the experiment itself. So experimenters need computers for command, control, data acquisition, and analysis for a wide variety of experiments, from crystal growth to biological to physics. Everything they want to do, they've got to catch the data, they've got to analyze the data, and they've got to control their experiment. And they need it in a plug-and-play environment with an accessible user interface. So Celestial Service is going to standardize and drive down the cost of computer hardware for the CubeSat form, form, format, basically something that looks about like this, picture down below. And the same experiment, the same equipment can be used for experiments all the way from tower drops, just dropping it off your school if you're a student, all the way up to the ISS. We estimate the total market for these command control computers to be upwards of 16,000 units through the year 2014. Okay, so far we've built uh, small data acquisition computers in pong size format, which basically fits inside a ping pong ball, and flown one of those to about 120,000 feet. Um, we've also gotten a NASA Phase One SBIR, which was uh, just under $100,000, for actually building the first version of some of these uh, um, NanoRacks compatible uh, data processing units, uh, which uh, they're hoping will make it easier for uh, experiments to be run on ISS. When we uh, deliver the hardware, which is unusual for an SBIR, uh, they'll have full information on the hardware. There are no safety issues with the hardware, and there's no problem getting it to ISS. In fact, we expect the, uh, our version of the flight hardware to fly in uh, early to mid-2012. Um, we're also applying for the uh, phase two of the SBIR, which if we get it is a half million dollars. Um, and and we've, we've basically secured the high ground in military parlance by, with an MOU with NanoRacks. You've heard them discussed a little bit uh, before. NanoRacks currently has on board ISS two NanoRack um, uh, facilities which fit the Cube Lab format. Um, we have an understanding with, that, with them that we hope to mature into a contract. So we truly have the high ground and we want to bring it, reverse migrate the technology all the way down at a level where schools can, can, can participate. Okay, well the product is not one product, but it's actually a small product line. At the lower end, uh, we envision in educational kits that would allow schools, uh, homeschoolers, anybody who has interest in space experiments to be able to essentially run the experiment on the ground that we're running in space. Those, uh, the entry level uh, boards would be in the $200 price range. The base model is what we're doing under the SBIR contract. It's good for nice generic experiments. You can collect data, collect a lot of data and provide, uh, allow the astronauts to get the data off uh, the module. We also have an advanced space model coming up which has higher performance uh, computational abilities. And then beyond that are the units that are for the more advanced users, which uh, are essentially the same units, either radiation hardened or non-radiation hardened. Um, so there's a low cost way to experiment with it before having uh, lay down the big bucks to get the same unit and a rad hardened ready for flight. The key here is all the products are going to be have fully licensed sub-assemblies. The IP is very clean here. We don't, we're not under contract for anybody else. Nobody else owns any of the IP of the develop. It's all developed in-house, and we're going to own all of that IP. So the management team. You've met Steve. Um, 30 years of hardware and software experience. He holds seven patents in the, uh, issued patents in the computer hardware and security devices. And I will tell you, as, uh, although I'm a lawyer, I spend more time with engineers than I do with lawyers. I have never met a computer engineer who is truly ambidextrous other than Steve, and by that I mean if your problem requires a hardware solution, he will build you the board. If your problem requires a software solution, he will write you the code, and if it's somewhere in between, he'll do both. And that's very, very unusual and why uh, I, I think there, there, there's such, you know, a certain special sauce here. Uh, the other thing is that Celestial Circus will leverage some of Steve's other company. You can actually think of Celestial Services almost as an SPE, a special purpose entity. Steve already has a warehouse. He already has a computer lab for his com computer forensics division. And so we, we can keep the overhead low for less Celestial Circus by, by use, utilizing that other, um, uh, other equipment that he has. And uh, Jim is a, a lawyer and also a technologist. He understands the technology and very familiar with space, but also he uh, can pick up a keyboard and do some programming and uh, help design some of the uh, hardware concepts. But as, as an attorney, he's been involved with many, many, many space startup and uh, computer uh, ventures. He's also been 10 years as a financial partner with a law firm in Washington, D.C. 
And finally, we brought in Don McMahon to be our Director of Educational uh, Outreach. As we say, we think there's a real STEM component here, the ability to have students running identical equipment, identical experiments in a controlled environment that are being run all the way up to, up to ISS. Don is a retired school teacher, uh, former Director of Technology from the Mesa, Arizona School District, and, and developed and designed the PBS award-winning space integration model simulation that now all sixth graders in Mesa run through a space simulation that, that Don designed. Uh, he has a wonderful knack for being able to create curriculum uh, for students, and he's also uh, the, the education director for the Teachers in Space Project. Okay, this is just a slide to show some of the uh, earlier software projects uh, that uh, uh, Jim and I have worked on, and I've worked on software for a long time. Uh, basically, I've shipped over a million units of software, even though probably nobody's heard my name or heard of my companies. <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. And, but I've also uh, been doing hardware for quite a, while, quite, excuse me, quite a while. Also, the scale and size of these modules that we're building is right in line with the type of hardware that I've been building uh, for other uh, projects. So there's no, we're not stressing the state of the art. We just have to be very careful in engineering to do this type of project. So, in conclusion, we're seeking funding of a half a million dollars in equity for 25% of the company. This is based on a company valuation, end of year 2014, of $11 million. And this is not a round one of X rounds of financing. This is the only financing we, we think we're going to need. The, the beauty of this company is it starts small, it scales linearly as the, as the market scales. We don't bring on people, we don't bring on uh, uh, additional overhead until we've got the revenues to, to, to satisfy that. Basically, thank you for listening. It's, now it's time to experiment. And we're happy to take your questions. So you didn't talk much about, oh, sorry. You, you didn't talk much about competition. So is this a brand new market opportunity to make these form, form factor computers that would go into this space station and have people on the ground do you know similar experiments so is there no one else in the market you're creating something new what indication do you have that there's you know that there's going to be a market well I'll, I'll take take a shot in in terms of the cube sat um, there are companies that that provide CubeSat enclosures and CubeSat computers they tend to be very very expensive sort of the starting price uh, of their entry model is, is the price of our Rad Hardened FP, PGA unit, $5,000 and up from there. And so they can't really access um, that, that the, the educational market at the, at the bottom. The market is coming online as, as we speak. We have NanoRacks um, up there on ISS now. They have list prices of $25,000 for a 1U cube lab, um, and they take care of all the launch. They take care of all the, all the safety. That's on board right, right now. Uh, and then, as we say, we want to reverse migrate that, all, that down um, before the suborbital uh, uh, rocket companies can launch people. The FAA is going to make them take a lot of flights. And they're not going to fly those things empty or just with rocks. And so there, there is the ability then to, to, to work with them um, you know, for these cube lab formats. So just one quick follow-up. So what you're saying is you're going to try to establish yourself as a vendor to, to the space station, and then based on that notoriety, you'll sell to the educational okay. market saying this is what the big boys do and you can model, you can match the experiment. And, and the other thing, could you talk about what the margins are in the product? You gave us the sales price, you didn't say uh, what it's gonna cost you to build them. Yeah, the basic standard model is in the $100, $150 range, and possibly less, just depends on quantity. For cost of goods sold, cost of goods. so 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 yeah, the the margin uh, is is basically depending on on the tier of unit between between thirty and well actually between twenty five and forty okay. percent uh, cost of good uh, goods sold. Um, just to to follow up on ISS already in NanoRacks, they they have flown I believe it's twenty five uh, um, separate school districts. Um, so school districts are already coming on on board. Twenty five thousand dollars is not unreasonable to, to to think for a school district to say hey we can have high school students fly an experiment. And the idea would be then to, to bring that back down so that whatever, the, if, it, if it's a crystal growth experiment, you can grow one on ISS, and then with the base units, ha have you know, additional students see what it, what it would be like to grow or not grow crystals on, on Earth. So it's kind of a top to bottom. It's a truly vertical marketplace. You, you mentioned that uh, the market is about 16,000 units through the year 2014. 
Tell us how that actually breaks down roughly into your market segments or customer sure. segments. Actually, if you can forward two slides. And uh, how do you uh, plan on approaching them, those customers? Right. So that, there's sort of the breakdown. It's a little bit of a busy um, showing our vertical markets, and it's truly from the ground up. Uh, we estimate as many 7,000 educational units. Just for, for a data point, there are over 10,000 high schools in this country. Combined high schools and junior highs, it's over 25,000 um, high schools. And as we move up, um, you, you see we have ground-based experiments. Those experiments that, that will test the components. Uh, obviously, if you're going to fly, especially fly to ISS, you're not going to buy one unit. You're going to buy ground units. You're going to buy ground spares. And then as we move up, uh, and then in the red uh, are, are the suborbital flights, both those to high altitude but not yet to space, and then the next level up uh, you know, into the suborbital markets. And this is based on a number of different discussions we have. We certainly know all, all of the providers. Uh, indications of how many flights they're going to need to go, uh, and then we go all the way up then to both the cube, you know, the cube sats. We will eventually uh, uh, compete directly with the couple of companies that are providing, um, and then the nano racks, upwards of 200 experiments by by uh, uh, 2014. Can you very quickly kind of state what your risks or obstacles might be to realizing the company or going going forward? Yeah, I think the major risk is that the market does not develop exactly as, as we plan. Um, certainly, um, as some people in this room, room know, who was one of the great mentors to, to news-based companies, Tom Rogers, who passed away last year. And Tom always, used to always say, it takes longer and it is more expensive than you ever think it's going to be. Um, we've certainly built that padding into uh, the pro formas. And, and again, the idea is to, is to expand the company slowly as the market comes online. We can sit this, if it takes three years or four years for, for the market to, to develop, you know, we will be able to sustain during, during that period. We don't, we're not requiring any miracle occurring here other than eventually, you know, people saying, yes, we do want to do apply these experiments. And you said that your target goal for the investment is 500000 Yes. But mm -hmm. also that if you apply for phase two, it's also 500000 Yes. Mm -hmm. So would you need one or the other, but you'll take both? Exactly. Okay. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I didn't know if you got yeah. the investment, you wouldn't apply for the SBRI. Oh, no, mm. of course you okay. want the SBIR, more. Mm. SBIR money, but mm -hmm. it's always more fun to have more money. Mm. Hi, uh, two questions, one market and one uh, competition. Uh, investors love when you have an alternative market to go to if the experimenter market doesn't work out or is delayed for three years. Mm -hmm. um, so first, could you talk about uh, any uh, alternative markets that you've explored or thought about? And secondly, um, you know, Clyde Space and, um, and Pumpkin, who you mm -hmm. mentioned in your, in your business plan, uh, are competitors. Um, they're more of a sort of one-stop shop where they sell you the cube and everything in it. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, it, it seems like you believe that because your computer will be maybe better and cheaper that people will buy the computer from you, but everything else from Clyde and Pumpkin. Uh, uh, it, it, first, you know, is, is that... Is that the premise, or could you actually use Clyde Space and Pumpkin as your distributor and have an agreement with them so that they sell your computer? Or well, Clyde Space likes to make power supplies, and they're very good at that. And I have no problem using one of their power supplies. But also, they are both uh, Cube, uh, CubeSat companies at the moment. They're, they're <laughs> building all the bits and pieces you need for a free-flying uh, CubeSat. We're starting out working with uh, Nanoracks on SBIR, and the requirements and the designs are completely unrelated to a cube set. Um, so we have our, we get to start in our little niche, and that's in fact what the SBIR is about: is trying to make a a nice, easy way for for a new experimenter to be able to use the uh, Nanoracks uh, platform. So we the, going after the cube set market is sort of an expansion area that we expect to go into, but we're initially starting with where we are mostly alone in, in the new market. Thank you, And our next finalist is Final Frontier Design, Ted Southern. Hi, uh, I'm Ted Southern. I'm a president and co-founder of Final Frontier Design, and we make spacesuits. Um, I think I'm in the right room to talk about the exciting future of human space travel. I think we're at sort of a sea change point in, uh, in terms of uh, 
sending people into space. It's uh, traditionally been the market of governments to get people up there, and uh, all of a sudden people are paying to go up to the ISS. There's a whole host of providers that intend to send humans up to space. I was really excited to see uh, Virgin Galactic talking about that this morning. And I think a huge part of that is going to be safety. Uh, it's really important that this industry remains uh, committed to safety, uh, sending humans up into space. And uh, space is a really hostile environment for humans. Uh, not only are there drastic thermal uh, issues and radiation and high speeds, but uh, perhaps the most dangerous part of space is pressure. There's uh, almost a complete lack of pressure up in space. The human body needs to breathe oxygen, and uh, consciousness is measured in seconds in a full vacuum for a human, human body. Uh, so we need some redundancy as far as pressure goes uh, for these initial uh, suborbital flights. And uh, I think uh, that redundancy is going to have to come from spacesuits. A similar uh, sort of redundancy in commercial um, airline travel would be from oxygen masks coming down from the ceiling. Uh, I think in space travel, this is going to have to be provided by a spacesuit. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, my name is Ted Southern. I'm an industrial designer in New York City. I've run a successful company making uh, props and costumes, special effects uh, for theater and uh, the movies for the last 10 years. Uh, I uh, have a partner in Final Frontier Design. His name's Nikolai Moistia, a Russian man who worked for Zvezda for the last 20 years, or rather for 20 years. His last six years at Zvezda, he was a lead suit designer. His uh, suit designs have flown on Mir and the International Space Station, and he worked both with NASA and with the European Space Agency, uh, developing uh, successful flown uh, suit hardware. Final Frontier Design is an outgrowth of a successful entry into the 2009 Astronaut Glove Competition. We placed second in that competition, outperforming NASA's current technology, and won $100,000 with our uh, single-layer uh, pressure garment design. Uh, we've gotten also a lot of support from NASA. We're in a Phase 1 SBIR that we'll be completing up next month, uh, developing uh, our glove technology further, and it's all single-layer glove technology. But we're not just interested in gloves. We're, we want to build a full suit. And about a year ago, almost exactly, we uh, unveiled our Frontier Prime, which is a, a prototype uh, space suit, uh, uh, sort of taking materials that we intend to use for a single garment suit and uh, mocking it up in a double layer, more traditional garment. Um, and uh, I keep mentioning the single layer concept. And I think it's really important for, to understand our uh, technologies and our strategy. All of our competitors, and I'm going to name them uh, the government contractors, ILC Dover, Hamilton Sunstrand, and David Clark, um, do intend to enter into this market of, um, of commercial space travel and spacesuits for commercial space travel, um, in addition to Orbital Outfitters, which is more of a startup company, uh, not in the government contracting realm. They all have double layer pressure garments. And what that means is there's an internal bladder and an external restraint. Uh, what we've done is sort of bonded that restraint to the bladder, and uh, I think we have a significant advantage over those companies uh, in that the single-layer bladder is less weight, lower mass. Those things are huge for space travel. Uh, they're more comfortable to wear while pressurized and unpressurized. Uh, single-layer garments are lower torque under pressure, so it's much easier to move. And significantly, they're easier and cheaper for us to produce. There's less material involved and significantly less labor. So we see a huge advantage in this technology, and uh, we're really excited about developing it into the future. You can see here this is a single-layer prototype elbow that we have with two neutral positions, kind of unheard of in extension and halfway into flexion. Um, so uh, we, we plan on, uh, this is a very modest proposal for our projected revenue. We started last year with an initial investment of $6,000. This year, we'll see revenue of $117,000 with uh, Phase 1 SBIR, and also an initial uh, contract with a Dominican uh, company developing Earth-based technologies that are related to, uh, related to the products that we're developing. Uh, we intend to apply for a Phase 2 SBIR, which will uh, help for funding in 2012 and 2013. Uh, in addition to developing our Earth-based uh, related technologies, um, mostly around pressure garments, um, and uh, hope to, uh, within the next couple of years, start providing these suits to uh, the, the host of suborbital and uh, eventually orbital providers. Uh, so we intend by 2014 to have a full contract with an orbital provider selling spacesuits to, to one of these companies. 
Uh, with that in mind, we're soliciting $750,000 for potential 10% ownership in our company. Um, we, we are really excited about the prototype technology we have, but we need uh, some money to, to bring that into fruition to actually realize some space-ready hardware. Um, and uh, while we don't, uh, we're not naive enough to think that we would have an IPO in the next couple of years, uh, we do think that we have a host of technologies that we can license. Um, and uh, with that, I, um, I'm particularly excited about the initial incremental stages that to, uh, to provide safety garments for low Earth orbit, or rather suborbital companies. But I feel like there's a big opportunity here for us to grow in the future past these uh, IVA safety suits for inside the vehicle. Uh, there's a lot of potential for thermal garments, liquid cooling garments, communications, and a host of other uh, inevitable um, safety garments that will be necessary for the future of human uh, space travel. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. So. So, so um, are you, is, do you have an estimate for the number of people you expect to serve so over some period of time? And I'm assuming these are custom made. So you, did, you talked about total revenue, but you didn't talk about sort of at the product level what, who, who you're selling to and, and who pays. Sure, sure. I think we're imagining selling to the, or the providers, the uh, company. We actually had conversations with them. Um, uh, with um, Armadillo Aerospace and uh, Space Adventures, uh, via Space Adventures, about providing these suits to Armadillo Aerospace. And um, I guess we're imagining those companies to be buying the suits from us. We're imagining a base price of about $75,000 for 10 flight, uh, certified for 10 flights. Um, it's obviously quite difficult to, uh, to, to estimate how many units these companies are going to need in the future, but uh, that projection of about $1.4 million in revenue in 2014 is based on maybe 15 suits, which I think is an extremely conservative uh, uh, estimate. I, I see a lot of new space companies that have excellent technologies and come from, at least have management teams with excellent te technology backgrounds. And the actual IP that they develop is uh, very unique and well thought through from a technology perspective. But the concerns that usually arise are concerning the market itself. Um, if a wonderful technology doesn't have a market, um, you know, the, the viability of the company is not that strong. This analogy applies in you know, many other industries, not just new space. So this is kind of an adjunct question to the one that was just asked. You answered kind of how big the market was. Can you tell us more about what the distinction is between space tourism markets versus other markets and where you see yourself fitting in relative to that? Um, I think I understand that question. I, obviously, our, our first focus is space tourism. I feel like uh, we want to grow incrementally with this growing market. and. Um, uh, low Earth orbit is, or rather, suborbital flights are sort of the perfect place for us to enter into spacesuits. Spacesuits are extremely complicated um, uh, engineered uh, garments, and um, we feel like that incremental um, first uh, step into suborbital companies is a, sort of the perfect place for us to develop our, our technologies. Um, as far as uh, other, other um, commercial options for spacesuits, um, I think a lot of uh, long-term um, potential is for EVA uh, spacesuits and the sort of things for um, maintenance on, on space hotels or the International Space Station. Uh, EVA spacesuits tend to be very complicated but can be incrementally improved from IVA suits. And so I think we see potential uh, growth there for uh, long-term for EVA suits. Does that make sense? So you... You articulated the um, advantages of a single layer spacesuit, but is there a desirable margin of safety from the old style dual layer spacesuits? Yeah, we've uh, tested these suits according to NASA standards. Um, we have burst tests upwards of 25 psi. Um, we uh, can go through cycling phases uh, that are equivalent to uh, the traditional double layer suits. Double layer suits can fail as well, they're all sewn. And I think a big advantage that we have is uh, this bonded technology that we have doesn't involve sewing at all. So we're not puncturing the garment. So uh, the safety uh, we find is, is equivalent. 
You talked about selling your suits to the suborbital companies to begin with for 10 flights per suit. But what about sizing issues? Are you imagining that they will buy like a fleet of suits for their customer base of the various yep. sizes? We're imagining a small, medium, and large suit. And uh, if we can go back to the single layer uh, elbow right there, it's actually an adjustable uh, size. So it's something that will have a medium size that can be adjusted to different, uh, okay. different capabilities. And that would work on the arms, on the legs. We actually have a uh, ankle uh, adjustment that would allow for somebody as tall as myself to wear the suit, uh, which is key. And uh, we would have, <laughs> we would also have uh, finger sizing so that each individual finger could be sized. Hi, uh, I've got a lot of questions, but I'm having trouble getting past the valuation and would like for you to talk a little bit about that. Um, for a company uh, at this stage with two founders and no customers yet, and a lot of development in front of you. 10% uh, for 750,000 seems rich, and I think you'd have trouble with a lot of the angel uh, stage investors and you know, VC investors supporting that. So can you tell us your thoughts behind that? Sure, sure. I guess I'm playing hard to get. I, I feel like I really have a ter terrific technology here, and uh, I feel like um, with uh, Nikolai's experience, uh, we have something really solid to stand on. So I'm, I am very confident in our technology. I feel like we're going to outperform our, tech, our competitors tremendously. The government contractors uh, are going to be about 10 times as expensive as we are. And so uh, with this market coming forward, um, I, I, I honestly believe we have a really strong company. So. Do you have built into your scheduling the time cost of money pending risks from flights not actually happening when they say they're going to, primarily with the issue of delay of first flights and commercial flights for um, the private space companies? If they're not flying when you think they are, according to your schedule, how will that affect your return on investment and requirements for funding? Um, that's a very good question. Um, we uh, we can I mean we can develop this technology very quickly, right. um, and uh, so I guess of course we would need to sell these suits before um, before these companies are actually space certified. Um, we anticipate having flight tests with with these companies uh, well before any actual uh, space flight would happen. Uh, we obviously do uh, hope to receive NASA funding over the next year. We're actually uh, having them in our lab in, a, in next week, which is unfortunately why Nikolai couldn't be here. Okay. And I, we think that's a really good sign okay. of confidence in NASA. So. Um, can you talk about any potential partnerships that you're thinking about or might uh, enter into um, for systems that are kind of above and beyond the suit, life support systems, things like that? Sure. Um, we um, initially, I think, with the IVA suit, life support would be through the spacecraft itself, and so we would have to have a lot of interaction with uh, whatever uh, provider we would um, work with. Um, life support, I think, in the end, is something that we can tackle ourselves. Um, but uh, we are interested in working with um, other companies. We have a good working relationship with both ILC and um, Hamilton, and uh, we would love to be involved in in um, developing technologies that are affordable for, uh, for commercial space flight. No? Oh, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> um, what's, the, what's the cost of developing the suits right now? Why do you, um, how does that change over time with more volume? Uh, the cost uh, right now is um, really encouragingly cheap. Uh, the, the fabrics that we're using are really standard fabrics. They're, uh, urethane laminated nylon, which is used in um, river rafts and blood pressure devices, very standard market thing, about $9 a yard. So uh, the cost of the suit in terms of um, uh, fabrics is uh, something like uh, seven to $800. Um, uh, labor is, um, uh, again, not much easier than a double layer suit. So uh, we, we see a really um, uh, significant um, margin in um, the, the price of the suit versus uh, the cost put into it. It's, it's a tremendous margin for us. So, so you're, you're at a 95% gross margin or something like that? 
uh, <laughs> in development now, it's taking some time and we're working for free, so it's um, uh, uh, probably something like 95%. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, our next finalist. These are great presentations I'm seeing today. It's absolutely outstanding. Um, our next finalist is New Space Publishing, Martin Cheney. Good morning, everyone. My name is Martin Cheney. I'm the president. Ah, sorry. Better? Okay. I'm Martin Cheney. I'm the president of New Space Publishing. And um, we are publishing currently a quarterly magazine which is completely devoted to the explanation and promotion of the commercial spaceflight industry. It is currently available in a digital format, and we hope to have a printed format available when the first tourists step off their spacecraft. Commercial spaceflight is making progress, but interest and awareness is only among those early adopter markets, the science and the space community. There is, however, a much, much larger or market that is not aware of commercial spaceflight and the promise it holds for helping those individuals realize their dream of traveling into space. Next slide. <clears throat> The big, our new space publishing conducted market surveys and we came up, as we spoke with people, we identified several obstacles that were, avail or that were prevalent as to why people did not understand or know about commercial space flight. Three of those obstacles came in the form of what you see on the slides there. The biggest obstacle was the lack of knowledge about the commercial space flight industry. There was also a belief that only governments can build spacecraft and those not seeing the benefits of commercial spaceflight. Those are the individuals that have forgotten how we all benefit on a daily basis from previous space research. These obstacles form a gap which keeps commercial spaceflight from being accepted by the mass market. So how do we bridge that gap? Next slide. We do it with New Space Magazine. New Space Magazine will address obstacles with articles showing that commercial spaceflight is a joint effort between private companies and government agencies. We will also show that companies are building safe, dependable, and economical spacecraft. Within the pages of the magazine, we will have articles by astronauts describing the thrill of weightlessness and the thrill of seeing the Earth without boundaries from the other side of the clouds. We will also have articles about the international space efforts that many people are not aware of, and also about educational space efforts, which many people are not aware of. The readers of New Space Magazine will realize that it's okay to once again dream of traveling into space. Next slide, please. The market for New Space Magazine, initially, is going to be made up of those that are interested in science and technology and science fiction. This will be the initial market for New Space Magazine. According to the statistics that we gathered, recorded in 2008, there were 12 million people in the United States that were interested in science and technology. There were 11 million people interested in science fiction. There were also, of course, many moviegoers. So that anyone who walked into a Star Trek movie or a Star Wars movie is a potential subscriber of New Space Magazine. This market is also full of individuals and companies, the people that run the companies, to become advertisers in the magazine as well. Okay, next slide, please. The competition. Yes, we have competition. There are many science or technical magazines that are available. These magazines over the last few years have run articles on the commercial space light industry. However, that is not the focus of those magazines. There are also internet uh, sites as well. And the internet provides volumes and volumes of commercial space flight articles if you're interested in wading through them.
to try and find information that is not a repeat and a repeat and a repeat of articles that you've seen before over the years. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, next slide, please. The company New Space Publishing itself, it is a persistent and adaptive organization. We are continually networking inside and out of the global space community for articles and authors and ideas for promoting commercial space flight. We are also <clears throat> coordinating with other organizations on different ways that we can inform the public about commercial space flight. The company itself in its daily operations uses project management and process improvement methods that helps us to deal with identifying risks and opportunities. The Board of New Space Publishing has a total of 60 years of business experience and 35 years of, of publishing experience. Next slide. Okay, sorry. The profitability of New Space Publishing is that <clears throat> in 2011, we will be establishing business foundation and also gathering information about uh, article writers and such. We know that it's going to take a little while before the new space industry launches its first vehicle, and so we want to take advantage of that opportunity, that time, to establish ourselves within the space community and also to provide a lot of information about commercial space flight. So that being the case, in 2011, we are planning on continuing to develop partnerships and advertising and subscriber sales. In 2013, we plan to have the public paper publication produced, and what that publication will do is provide us a great deal more income as far as advertising within the pages of the magazine. Next slide. New Space Magazine is seeking $150,000 in funding to get us through to 2013. As you can see that we are looking at spending money on industry promotion, magazine production, magazine marketing, operations, and of course, we're gonna hold back a little bit for contingencies. Next slide, please. It's important that you all realize that New Space Magazine is not just dedicated to a particular program like going to the moon or going to Mars. New Space Magazine is also not dedicated just to an organization. It's also important that you realize that New Space Magazine is not just reporting the news in the commercial space flight industry. New Space Magazine is about promoting an industry that has the potential to fulfill people's dreams. Thank you very much. So, Maybe the first obvious question, um, why is it not just a blog online or something like that? I mean, the, um, the advantages of being up to date, being easier to distribute, cheaper to distribute, reaching more people. Um, a magazine is a, a sort of novel approach to this in 2011. Yes, and that's actually part of it because one of the things that we, we have come to understand is that there were a lot of people who during the uh, NASA space program of the 1960s, who had the dream and carried it into actually the 70s as well. And what we're targeting, part of the market that we're targeting is those individuals that had that dream. And one of the things that's important about this is that we are, because of our digital format, we're appealing to a younger audience, an audience that is considerably more electronic uh, literate. But we also want to produce the magazine because it's more tactile, if you will. Uh, you can rifle through the pages. You can carry it in your back pocket when you get in a conversation about commercial space flight. You can pull it out and say, hey, did you see this kind of a thing. So we're appealing to two different audiences with both a digital and uh, a paper publication. I kind of have a related question. I was actually recently in a, um, a meeting with a newspaper and magazine publisher in the area. The CEO stood up in front of the entire team and said, print is dead. What the hell do we do now? And the entire meeting was focused on brainstorming. 
And a lot of the conversation actually focused on mobile applications, um, iPhone apps, things of the like. Have you thought through that to kind of coincide with your digital uh, dissemination of content? Yes. Sorry. Mobile applications? Yes, as a matter of fact, we have. And one of the, the nation, well, a Canadian distributor that we have been working with has an offering of those mobile applications as well. And so we've been talking with them to be able to put the digital version through those applications as well. So um, whether you're talking about uh, you know uh, a paper subscription, a, a, a paper product with the with, you know certain circulation, or a digital product where there's a certain um, uh, activity level in terms of uh, visits to a website, um, have, could you give us some sense? It's a chicken and egg problem. You can't get advertisers until you have subscribers, and you can't get subscribers until you know there's something to go look at, and people have to pay for. So. Is there, do you have in mind a crossover point, how many subscribers or users you're gonna need to effectively attract advertisers? And maybe the, the, the uh, associated question is, have you talked to advertisers and how much demand or how much interest are you seeing for this product? Uh, that is a, an absolutely excellent question and we've run head to head smack into that particular situation. We have been talking um, with distributors as well, uh, several of the nationwide ones. We've actually signed with one. And what we have found, and that is what you're describing is absolutely appropriate in regards to the uh, chicken and egg thing. And what we have, what, one of the reasons why we decided to go with a digital publication initially is because, because of the interest level or the lack of interest level that we found, we realized that we have a lot more visitations to our website. A lot more people are staying there for three to four minutes on the website. And so it's going to be, well, it is much easier for to convince advertisers to advertise on the website as opposed to a paper publication at this point. And so we are, in fact, counting a lot on the publicity that will surround the first flights of uh, space tourism. And so what we are anticipating is that we will be able to, we will have that demand for a paper product and we can solicit advertising because we'll be able to show the progress that we've made with the digital publication. Could you explain um, what you mean by $55,000 to promote the industry? It's, sort of, it's more than a third of the funds you're asking for. I would think you know, the Virgin Galactics and x -Cores with bigger uh, funds and balance sheets would be mostly promoting the industry. It just seemed like an odd use of funds for a, a startup company. Okay. What do you mean by that? All oh, right. The reason why, as I mentioned, is that one of the biggest obstacles is lack of knowledge. And so if the commercial spaceflight industry goes largely unknown, then that makes it difficult for us to turn a profit and produce a magazine. So we have to do what we can do, and hopefully this can be actually in concert with some of the companies like Xcor and Virgin Galactic, uh, kind of a cooperative marketing, if you will, so that we can go after um, promotional areas that will bring commercial spaceflight to the forefront of people's minds. You know, maybe those areas where Virgin Galactic is not marketing. Um, there are a lot of different areas outside of the space industry that we need to reach. So I didn't answer that question, did I? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit hard for you. I, um, last night we had a dinner with 16 people, mostly NASA, and at the end of the dinner, our waiter came over and said how much he enjoyed listening to our conversation. He was a history st student in college, and then he turned to George Whiteside and said how cool Virgin Galactic was and that people could go into space now. This morning I'm at the Doubletree Hotel having breakfast, and our waitress came over and said, how lucky we were to be in a hotel with 200 geniuses. And, um, and then how cool it was now that people for $200,000 could, could uh, to fly into space. So, I mean, that, that was from one dinner to one breakfast. You know, two people serving us meals were both very aware of, of commercial space flight. So I, I just, I'm not sure. It sounds like it, there's some, some bit of a, a missionary aspect to this business plan in terms of promoting space flight as opposed to being focused on making money in this niche, and I, I just... And 
and right so. And, and actually, you, you're correct in saying that, because um, for us to promote commercial spaceflight and make it well known in the general public is to get that public to purchase our magazine. And so one of the things that I would, I would say is I wonder how many people that those two individuals that you saw between dinner and breakfast have talked with other individuals and found out what they were here for and, and all that. So um, I think there's going to be a lot of area where we're going to have to promote in order for us to be able to sell. And that's why there is such a larger amount of the requested funds for that purpose. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Martin, so much. Um, and last up today is uh, Solar Flare, Shannon and Michaela Deesh. Hi, uh, we'd like to thank you all for letting us come out here today. Uh, this is our business, our business plan, and we are Solar Flare. Uh, this is my sister, Shannon Deesh. She is a 10th grader from Battle Creek, Michigan. Uh, for the past two years, she's attended Western Michigan University. Uh, she loves math, science, and technology and space, so much so that she even completed physics and calculus while still in eighth grade. This is my sister, Michaela. She's a high school senior from Battle Creek, Michigan. She's currently sitting on the board of Yuri's Night and the Conrad Foundation Alumni Committee. In 2009, she interned at the Michigan House of Representatives and received two special tributes from the governor of Michigan. Uh, oh. Solar Flare spun out from a team that entered and won the Conrad Foundation Spirit of Innovation Awards. The foundation tasked us to create the first commercially viable space food product in decades, which turned out to be a nutrition bar that met the requirements of NASA. Um, after the competition, Michaela and I decided we wanted to market our bar, and as a result, it flew on the, to the ISS on Endeavor in May 2011. Uh, the bar market is over $3 billion as of 2010. Uh, our space background is a natural lead-in for a functional food product that focuses on mental performance and cognitive health. Uh, there are a lot of bars in the market that focus on like diets or uh, athletes, but none that really focus on nerds and their mental performance. And <laughs> as nerds, we thought we should be better represented. So um, we have come up with a patentable process of uh, stabilizing DHA, which is an omega-3 that makes up about 30% of the brain structure. And we found a way to stabilize it in our bar, which is pretty exciting. Uh, there's also a powerful marketing opportunity that comes from Shannon and uh, my personal stories. As Mikhail said, the bar market is about $3 billion as of 2010. The nutrition bar market makes up about $1.13 billion of that total. The bar market has grown significantly in the past five years, mainly due to the um, products positioned in the health and wellness category. Innovations in that category have grown significantly. Uh, we have identified three major trends that support the vision of our company. Uh, the first is a growth on uh, focus on brain health benefits. Uh, people are becoming more and more aware of the importance of cognitive health. Uh, the second is a growth in the functional food market. And functional foods is basically any food that does more than fill you up. It uh, provides um, antioxidants and fiber and has other health benefits. And the third is the advancement in nutrition science technology that has driven a consumer demand for these types of products. To meet these growing trends, we've created Brainstorm, a nutrition bar that meets the requirements of NASA and has supports brain health with inclusions of DHA. In October 2010, we held focus groups to validate our concepts. Uh, our bar received a 4.0 on a scale of 1 to 5 in overall liking and a 4.1 in uniqueness. Our mental energy model was highly valued by customers. And when we added a reason to believe, such as contains omega-3 fatty acids, it added a great deal of purchase intent. The fact that the product was developed specifically for NASA added a great deal of um, buying intent for the older generation. Uh, for teenage, for, sorry, young adults, the fact that we were teenage entrepreneurs that had created the product would inspire them to be more likely to buy. Michaela and I are hoping that we can use this bar as a channel between young adults and space exploration.
Uh, for our go-to-market strategy, we are, are launching Solar Flare as a single serve format with four SKUs, which a SKU is a stock keeping unit, which is a fancy word for saying a flavor. Uh, our distribution places us into major retail stores across the country. Uh, we plan to initially launch in regional markets and expand as we get larger. And our initial uh, launch will be supported by an ongoing PR campaign and marketing out out efforts. Yeah. Solar Flare is planning on leveraging outsourced manufacturers and distribution partners to enable rapid scale without large over fixed overhead. This means basically we're going to use an outsourced manufacturer to make our bars. Then they'll send the bars to a distribution partner, and they'll send the bars to the store, which will sell them to the consumer. Um, this will cut our costs because we won't have to invest in machinery to make our bars or trucks to transport them. Uh, this is a list of all the stores that we would like to get into and the number of each store that we want to get into. Uh, they're split, obviously, into five different categories, and we want to get into Walmart, Target, CVS, Meyer, which you guys don't have Meyers out here, but they're pretty <laughs> big back in the Midwest, and a bunch of other places. Um, the category average churn, which is how many bars like get sold per week, is about 2.9 bars per week per store per SKU, which, as Mikhail said, is a stock keeping unit. This means if we have four SKUs, we'll sell about 12 bars per week per store. Uh, the unit volume is 10.1 million units per SKU if we penetrate every store that we want to. At 70% all commodity volume, which means we reach about 70% of the stores that we want to, uh, the average retail uh, dollar volume will be $9 million per SKU and $36 million if we have four SKUs. Gross margins will be healthy at 34% in year two and 39 in year three. These are healthy for the food market. Um, a hit home run is like 40%. So, uh, We hope to get into 2%, 7.5%, and 20% all commodity volume, volume in years one, two, and three respectively which will result in a 6.3 million gross sales in year three and 20.6 million in year five. Uh, this will give us a company valuation of $15.75 million in year three, and this is assuming a 2.5 times net sales, which is just the industry standard. Um, some company milestones include us completing the formulation of our bar and having it fly on STS-134, which is Space Shuttle Endeavor. We've successfully completed our DHA stability testing. We've um, validated our concepts during multiple focus groups. We're in the process of filing patents for our DHA sta stabil sorry, stabilization process. We've created multiple flavors to go to market, and we've established um, significant media presence with CNN, Fox News, MTV, as well as many others. Uh, this is a list of our team and advisory members. They include Mr. Jeff Grog who was the uh, VP of R&D at Kashi, Ms. Margie Jusik, who works for Kellogg's, uh, Mr. Ernie Pang, who was a marketing guy for Kashi, Ms. Gwen Griffin, who is the founder and CEO of Griffin Communications, Mr. Rick Fisher, who is a marketing online marketing whiz, and Congressman Mark Schauer, who's a local politician in our area. We're currently seeking $600,000 in capital. We can either do this in a single financing or uh, split $300,000 Series A and $300,000 Series B 12 months later. These funds will be used for production of our bar, our PR campaign, hiring key person management personnel, and attracting marketing and distribution partners. Our anticipated exit strategy is a sale of the company in three to five years. This, there will be strong exit options generated with potential for significant return of investment for our investors. And does anyone have any questions? All right, so I, I, I'll ask the first question. So here, so clearly that was a very professionally uh, uh, prepared and presented business plan. So you did a great job, and it was so detailed. It definitely hits, you know, from the business I'm in, looking at business plans every day. It definitely hit all all the key items. So. The one question I've got, and, and uh, I don't mean it to be a real hard question, but I do, I do think it's worth asking, is we are at a space-focused uh, business plan competition. Mm -hmm. And you d the origins of the product are from, you know, from this industry. But it just seems to me that 
are, are you expecting to sign an agreement with NASA that this is the official nutrition bar of NASA? And I kind of mean that seriously, because if you're going to promote it as a product that's kind of tied to this industry, um, you're, it seems like the promotion is focused on, well, I guess the astronauts would care about nutrition, not about improving their brain power in the two weeks they're up in space. So it's probably nutrition oriented. Are you going to kind of make this statement and the main promotion would be, well, the astronauts use it, so therefore you should? Have you thought about how to tie it to the space industry? Uh, we have. Um, part of what we want to do is we're trying to find a way to, like you said, tie it back to the space industry because part of what we're doing is promoting STEM education to uh, students because we believe it's important to help uh, inspire the next generation in uh, space because we were really inspired by this. And so we want to find a way to uh, tie it back to the space industry, like you said, because that is really important to us. And then do you have anything to add, Shannon? Yeah, basically what Mikhail said, we're working, um, there's another side of our company, which I don't want to go into all the details of because that'll take a long time, but um, we're reaching out to schools to inspire them about STEM and space, which is, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I had a question around uh, kind of the uniqueness of your company. There's a lot of things that are very unique about the company itself. And one of the, I guess the secret sauce is, well, I guess sauce is probably the bad word for a nutritional bar. <laughs> so the, the secret ingredient is your proprietary process for DHA, mm -hmm. which I think is actually very critical. Can you talk more about the stabilization process? Who is doing that for you? Uh, when will it be patented? You mentioned that earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about the DHA process itself okay. and why it's unique to you. We have to be a little careful because we don't want to reveal <laughs> any of our secrets. But um, what we have been working on is DHA is very, very unstable. The um, pure form of DHA, which is the oil, and it's all natural, and it smells and tastes like fish. And a lot of companies have tried and failed to find a way to stabilize it in their bar and have it so that it doesn't taste like fish because... I don't like fish, and trying to get the DHA or the benefits of DHA is really hard if you don't eat fish. So um, we have uh, found a way to stabilize it using our patented uh, formula, and we're actually currently in process of, pat of patenting it right now, actually. And we have been working with a food lab um, in Battle Creek, and we have signed an agreement with them uh, for um, the uh, process. So, And I think that answers your question. In terms of mental energy in a bar, do people just want caffeine? I mean, we had a little discussion here about the diet of nerds, and, and we figured it was almost 100% coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I, I drink. I don't drink coffee, but um, I think a lot of people... Just like wait until you start working. <laughs> <laughs> I think they are. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people do like the uh, energy that coffee brings, but a lot of people do get jitters and get obviously a little bit addicted to caffeine. And so if there's a way to get the energy and the mental awareness without coffee, I think that's probably a better way. Have you guys considered more selling or licensing the DHA patent to yeah. a food manufacturer rather than trying to subcontract with mm -hmm. the actual manufacturers? Um, we have talked about that. We haven't quite decided if we want to do that or if we want to keep it for solar flare specifically, okay. but we have thought about yeah, it. Yeah, we've, okay. we've had some discussions around that. Can you talk about your future roles in this company? I mean, you're still in school, yeah. college. It's an exciting company, and it was a very impressive presentation, but are you going to be running it? or? Um, well, obviously, we can't spend like all day at the office running it because we do have school <laughs> and we have other focuses that we have to worry about. Uh, our plan is as soon as we get some funds raised, we're going to start um, searching for a management team. A few of our uh, advisors have agreed to come on as part-time or maybe even full-time uh, management or to help us search for a CEO because, like I said, obviously we won't be able to run it properly like I wish we could. <laughs> how, how big do you expect uh, a business like this can get, um, standalone? Well, there's one brand which we always talk about is Fiber One, which is a functional food that Kellogg started, I want to say, like three or four years ago, and it is currently a half billion dollar business. So we're hoping we can get that big. 
And are there any independents? As in, you know, Kellogg have a brand and distribution separate. This, um, the challenge here, I mean, this isn't my area of yeah. expertise, but um, I see the challenge here being more of a marketing and um, getting the cost down production challenge. And this is all, things are a lot easier if you're a big company like Kellogg. Yeah. Um, so I, I wondered where you kind of see as an independent you can get to. Um, well, part of the way we're doing it, it's actually a really good system. It's using our uh, outsource manufacturers and brokers because then we have very low overhead costs and that allows us to scale at a really fast rate. I'm not sure any sizes of uh, independent companies. We're from Battle Creek, so we have Kellogg's base there. So a lot of our stuff is based off Kellogg's data because we're able to get that easier. But I'm not sure sizes of independent companies yeah, right I'm now. I'm not sure. But um, a lot of our ingredients and manufacturing costs have been cut because people have been donating to us. So like we have a lot of ingredients in the lab waiting for us so we can produce it once we get enough funds to actually run it. But we have like a lot of people are donating stuff to us. So. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> It's amazing watching these presentations today is a great testament also to the great work everyone did at yesterday's boot camp. Because I know, I know Liz Kennett can attest, we saw some pretty raw recruits in there yesterday, and they all came out and did a really polished job. So let's uh, give them another big hand. <clears throat> And I do not envy the judges their deliberations. I know I've, uh, I've been a judge myself. I look at a lot of business plans myself, and I was itching to come in with questions a couple of times. I had to hold myself back. But uh, uh, you folks, the judges will be retiring to a conference room where they'll be doing their deliberations. And they'll, uh, we'll, be, we'll be announcing the winners, of course, at tomorrow night's gala. Uh, I got one more announcement. I said something earlier about audience participation. I don't know if the slide's up there, if we can, put, we can get that going. Uh, there we go. There we go. We're announcing the, the beta launch of a new product for online polling called Palooza.com. And we thought, since this product was developed by uh, one of our own, Chevrolet, and in full transparency, I wrote him his first check. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we thought, what a better way to uh, beta test this product than by trying it out with our friends in the space community. And it's really, uh, it, nothing you do, of course, is binding on any of the judges' decisions, but uh, it gives you a chance to participate. There's already an online poll ready to go for you. All you have to do is log on to that website. You have it with your smartphone or your, or your laptop. You, uh, they'll ask you to create an account with your email address. We don't share any of that. It'll, after the beta test is over, that all goes away. But uh, and give them, and they ask for some demographic information, give as much or as little as you like. That really helps us, because what's part of Palooza is that we could do custom analytics on the fly really, really easily, and which is part of the appeal for the product. So everything's private. Um, vote early, vote often. Feel free also, also to submit comments of any kind, and we'll be sharing the results of that at the end of the conference. Also, there'll be a second poll later on that's going to come up that will be uh, will have to do with uh, the conference sessions themselves and what you thought about those. So feel free to participate, play, have fun, let us know what you think. Um, thank you all for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. competition and that will be run by an advocate and a board member of the Space Frontier Foundation who's also a managing partner at X's consulting firm. Please welcome to the floor Thomas Andrew Olson. Good morning. This, uh, I like to say this thing has been a long time coming but it really hasn't. We put this together I think in record time to, uh, to get this thing going. I think we have some really great business plans for you guys to look at today, and we have an equally distinguished panel of judges to, uh, to uh, pass the judgment on them. Um, next slide, please. So our pri as again, as we've stated, our prizes, our prizes are uh, $25,000 for first, $5,000 for second, and $2,500 for third. The first and third place prizes were from a, from a um, a grant just recently received from NASA to the Space Frontier Foundation, and the $5,000 second prize was from a grant from the Heinlein Prize Trust, which has been a long time uh, patron of this competition. Next, please. Um, 
that's what I mean about the short amount of time, since the, uh, the, the major grant did not come until June 2nd. We only had about seven weeks to really shout this thing from the rooftops and make it happen. But in all that time, we still got 36 intents to compete. We got 25 executive summary submissions, and we managed to distill that, and not an easy task, down to five finalists. Next, please. Um, before I get to the judges, though, I was asked, I need to do a special shout out here because uh, yesterday, as part of this competition, we ran an all-day seminar. It was, a, uh, it was called a boot camp for, for the contestants, and they got to sit one-on-one -on -one with, with coaches from the industry to really help them polish their presentations and, and, get their, and make sure they're getting out the key facts for the judges to see. And I want to give a, a special shout out to all the, all the coaches, including Liz Kennick, who did a great job running the show as well. Uh, my associate over here, uh, Joel Venus, is going to be a, also be our timekeeper today. Uh, and the coaches, Amarish Kolapara, uh, Shabra Lee, David Livingston, Bob Werb. So uh, now let me introduce our judges today. We have a very distinguished panel. Now you're going to have to excuse me on this because of all the time that I've, I've spent doing lots of other things. I didn't have time to actually memorize their uh, their bios, so I'm going to have a Wrath of Khan moment here. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I'm going to, I'm going to start at that end. Our first, our first judge, our first judge is Steve Goldberg, PhD. He's from Benrock. Uh, he joined Benrock in 2009, having been CEO of several early stage companies, including Data Runway, Vidient, ArcWave, and CoWave Networks. He was Vice President of Research and Development at Nokia Internet Communications and VP and GM of the Wireless Communications Division at Silent Corporation. He's also held senior management engineering positions at Trimble Navigation and Hewlett Packard. Uh, he has a, and he has his uh, PhD in electrical engineering from the University of California. Please welcome Steve Goldberg. To his left, our next judge is an investment professional at Draper Fisher Yurvitson, focusing on technology investments across sectors. Prior to joining DFJ, he was an analyst at Sloan Robinson, a global emerging market hedge fund based in London. And at Sloan Robinson, he concentrated mainly on China and India, and also the technology, transportation, telecom, and luxury goods sectors. Um, he, prior to working in finance, he started he was, started three companies, including an online music service with a proprietary algorithm for personalizing the price of digital music. He has a B in computer science from Oxford, has completed level three of the CFA program. Please welcome Xander Mahoney. Our next judge is the founder and managing partner of Near Earth LLC. Previously, he was the managing director in the telecom group at Credit Suisse First Boston. His investment banking career began all the way back in 1987 as an associate of one of approximately 100 bankers at Donaldson, Lovkin, and Ginrette. And he was part of the phenomenal growth and success of DLJ to over 1,000 bankers by the time of his acquisition in 2000. At DLJ, Hoyt, he was a, Hoyt was a co-founder of the firm's Space Finance Group, Wall Street's first dedicated industry coverage group for the satellite industry. Welcome, Hoyt Davidson. Our next judge serves as a management consultant and financial advisor to a generation of space entrepreneurs by helping them develop viable businesses and navigate the world of venture finance. He co-produced the, fir the first and second annual Space Venturing Forum, an entrepreneurial event hosted by the National Space Society. In a related capacity, he's an executive committee member of the Space Investment Summit Coalition, which is a group of organizations focused on developing interaction between the investment community and entrepreneurial efforts in aerospace. He often speaks at aerospace conferences, and topics related to the business and economics of the commercial space industry. Here's something I didn't know about him. He has a degree in molecular and cell biology, which is something we never talk about. I have a degree in biology. We never talk biotech. Well, we have to start doing that. <laughs> he also is a man. He just has the most sense of anyone I know in this group. <laughs> Amaresh Kalapara. Our our final judge is a last-minute replacement. Art Dula from Highline Prize Trust was supposed to be seated amongst this group today, and he couldn't make it because of medical issues. And of course, we, uh, as a great patron of this competition, we certainly wish him the best for a speedy recovery. Uh, however, he sent someone really great in his place. Uh, she is a researcher and intern program manager for Excalibur Almaz USA. Um, her project, current projects involve asteroid mining and lunar cyclers. Her work, work with Excalibur has led to involvement with the Highline Prize Trust, 
which led her to becoming president of the Virginia Edison Publishing Company. Um, prior to that, she was a member of NASA Academy at Marshall Space Flight Center. And while completing her undergraduate mathematics at Eastern University, she's also been a judge in the Rice University Business Plan Competition. Please welcome, at the last minute, 48 hours notice, God bless her, Leah Ott. <laughs> Next. Okay, these are the finalists, Altia Space Machines, Celestial Circuits, Final Frontier Design, New Space Publishing, and Solar Flare. These groups really represent a great cross-section of the kinds of space entrepreneurial activity that we want to see. We've got space, we've got space-related, and a new category, space scalable, which is something that will hopefully make investors lots of money here on the ground in commercial markets, but also is scalable to solve a space problem when that's needed down the road. And we've got representatives of all three amongst our, our group of finalists today. Next, please. Um, so here are the rules, very simple. Uh, each team gets a 15-minute block of time, eight minutes they have to, uh, to make their presentation, followed by the judges, uh, hammering them with questions and comments for another seven minutes. We're going to be really strict with that. Joel Venus is going to be the timekeeper, and he's going to keep, keep us on track so we can get done quickly. At the, at the end, after we've seen all five, please stick around because I have a, uh, a last-minute announcement for you, and it involves audience participation. So uh, stay tuned for that. Our, okay, first up is uh, Althea Space Machines. Okay, um, I'm John Goff, President and CEO of Altia Space Machines, and we are developing a solution that enables nanosat launch providers to deliver payloads directly to space stations. Uh, not only does this unlock a huge new market for them, this also will enable us to achieve 20 to $70 million in annual revenues once we've scaled up to full commercial operations, and ultimately enable us to change the way space deliveries are done forever. Okay, right now, uh, just-in-time payload delivery, or just-in-time small package deliveries are a critical part of the terrestrial economy. However, this capability is not available to uh, space station utilizers such as NanoRacks and their customers. Next slide. Um, existing uh, existing uh, delivery vehicles such as the uh, SpaceX um, Dragon, they work very well for bulk cargo delivery but just as you wouldn't send a single FedEx package on a 747 all by itself, you wouldn't fly a Dragon with just a single small payload. Right now you have to manifest it in a bigger payload, which by definition makes it no longer just in time. There are currently uh, several companies in the suborbital RLV uh, group and, and elsewhere, such as X-Core Aerospace, Scale Composites, um, Unreasonable Rocket, uh, Dynetics, that are developing what are called nanosat launch vehicles. These vehicles can put small satellites, things about this big, uh, up into space. And while they're right size for delivering these small payloads to the space station, they currently are unable to do so. Uh, the, the complex delivery vehicles such as Dragon, they don't scale down small enough and actually leave you any payload left over. Just the proximity operation sensors on Dragon alone are bigger than the payloads that we're talking about delivering here. Next slide. So the customer that we're trying to, the customer need we are addressing with Altius Space Machines is this need of how do you, you know, how can we enable these, uh, these nanosat launchers to service this market? If we can uh, enable them to service this market, not only are we opening a huge new market for them, but we're also addressing the needs of space station researchers and manufacturers and ultimately making them more competitive uh, compared to terrestrial counterparts. Next slide. So the solution that Altius has uh, developed, we're calling it our direct-to-station delivery service. What this does is it offloads the complex delivery functions from the visiting vehicle to the actual space station itself and allowing any rocket to service its own delivery vehicle. Um, next slide. So let me walk you through a quick cartoon of how this works. So first off, you have, um, on the space station itself, you have a, uh, a sensor and control system that can tell exactly where the vehicle is and calculate the optimal trajectory. Next slide. Uh, it sends a series of burn commands to that vehicle that allows it to navigate 
to a safe standoff distance from the space station that is close enough, next slide, to enable our sticky boom, which I'll explain in a second, to reach out, safely grab it, and pull it into the station. Next slide. Okay, this, uh, the sticky boom, for, for lack of a better term, is a mechanical tractor beam. This thing can reach out and stick to almost any object you can think of in space. Uh, metals, plastics, asteroids, any, anything. Uh, we're developing this uh, in collaboration with SRA International here in Silicon Valley, who invented the electrotegian technology that we're using uh, to enable this uh, you know, sticking to any surface. Um, the cool thing about this is that while it sounds sci-fi, it's actually real. Uh, we brought a prototype, we fl flight tested this on a zero gravity plane here in Silicon Valley a couple months ago. And if anyone wants to try it out after all the presentations, uh, we'll be out in the hall and we'll run it till the batteries run dry. Uh, next slide. So we have a cool technology, but we've been getting real traction and interest from commercial, uh, from NASA and commercial uh, customers. We're currently working on a NASA contract uh, for Mars sample return. Um, we've also uh, we've also recently joined a Lockheed Martin joint proposal. Uh, for demonstrating a version of uh, this technology for uh, space junk uh, removal that will ultimately provide some of the technologies we need for our direct to station solution. Next slide. And we intend to leverage this trend in, in government and commercial interest to enable us to cover the, use that to cover the R&D expenses of bringing this technology all the way to commercial operations. Once we are in commercial operations, we're looking at a lease fee model where we would lease the hardware and provide operations and maintenance services uh, for the space station operators, and then we would charge a fee directly to the delivery vehicles. Um, and as you can see, even at, uh, even at weekly flights, we're getting up into the $20 million, uh, $20 million in annual revenue mark, just from commercial, uh, uh, commercial alone. So the management team we put together is very well uh, focused on this, uh, on, this, on this marketplace. My background is a co-founder of one of the suborbital rocket companies that's interested in developing these nanosat launch capabilities. Gives me a great insight into this market and not only that, I'm on a first name basis with the CEOs of almost all of our potential customers. Uh, the rest of the team we pulled together has decades of experience in aerospace uh, sales, marketing, business development, and finance. And uh, our acting CTO has 20 years experience at NASA and in commercial industry uh, developing um, deployable structures very similar to the boom part of our sticky boom. Uh, next slide. So we are raising $400,000 at, at the current time. Uh, the main focus of this, uh, we, we list several near-term things we intend to spend that on. Uh, the big, one big part is securing our IP 